I think we ordered initially about half a dozen t-shirts. I thought, who would want, <laughs> who would want a Gold's Gym t-shirt? I came up to this area, which is Oakland, and uh, I went to a uh, bar, nightclub, or whatever, and there was a band up there called Mr. Clean and, and something. I said, get yourself a Mr. Clean bottle and make me a drawing of Mr. Clean with a barbell. Here's how that happened. I had designed the Gold's Gym logo in 1973 on a napkin in Zookie's Deli with Ken Waller and Arnold. I think Ken Sprigg might have been there. He um, gave uh, an artist, uh, Rick Drayson, a gym member, a Mr. Clean bottle. He says, I want the t-shirt to look like this, except with a barbell. So Rick made a bald-headed man look sort of like Mr. Clean with a lot more muscle, and he put a barbell in the middle of it, and the barbell was straight. I said, everything's good, Rick, except we're just gonna bend the barbell. And that's where the original logo came from, uh, that we put on the Gold's Gym stuff. Mr. Clean will clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean. And sure enough, that goofy old Gold's Gym logo was born. So they printed up all these shirts, maybe a dozen or two, and they sold them all out the first day. Well, slowly we'd get letters from people around the country, can I buy one of those t-shirts? So they said that we need more, and Ace Joe, we started printing more. And it, it built from there, and then thousands, by the time I sold many thousands uh, a month, would be sold. And so they started selling more and more, and it became, over the years, the largest selling logo in the world. The way it was set up to promote it, I tell producers, if you need a, a place for gym location, come on down to Gold's. You know, use the facility free. Anytime you want to do a TV spot or a movie spot, you go ahead and use it with one restriction. Have to have a Gold's Gym t-shirt <laughs> across the chest. And then from that point on, that propelled it into the general public. When I talked to Ken Sprague, he remembers it. He says, I think you paid Rick $25 to draw that thing. I said, I don't remember that at all. I never got a dime for it. I just said, take it. I didn't realize this. Welcome back to the history of bodybuilding. As you saw in the little preview clip we, uh, we aired uh, before the show started, um, we have a documentary coming out on the history of Venice, essentially. And the man who made it is here today, Mark Martinez. Welcome to the show. Uh, your documentary is called Dream Big, which is uh, a, a very apt title for, uh, for this documentary, considering that a lot of bodybuilders went out to California and made that pilgrimage out there to Gold's Gym because they had big dreams and they wanted to achieve greatness. And of course, the biggest probably dream out, the dreamer out there was Arm Schwarzenegger. And we know what happened with him. Welcome to the show, number one. Number two, tell us about how this whole documentary came about. Well, um, thank you, Dave. And thank you to, to Ed Connors for, for, um, for, for setting this up. I appreciate it. Um, I got started on this on the documentary basically because um, I was a teenager. I lived, I grew, I grew up in Southern California, and um, about the time I became aware of bodybuilding, I was probably freshman in high school, and uh, probably lived about 20 miles away from the original Gold's Gym. And a couple of my buddies and I were looking at the book Pumping Iron in school, and. Uh, at that time, you're looking at these photos of these guys, and there's just no reference point for them. It was just, especially in the middle 70s, right? You're looking at, at that. And uh, uh, anyway, I think a couple of years later, uh, when I got serious and I had a car, uh, drove out there. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, we, and we found out, we're like, oh, well, the original gold um, has been turned into a house. Uh, the owner, Ken Sprague, turned it into his house and moved uh, Golds to Santa Monica to Second Street. Right. So that's that was kind of my entry into it. Um, did and Ken, that was own, Ken own that house? I didn't know. He, I didn't know he lived in that house actually, as an actual house for a while. He, yeah, he he did for a bit. He um, he. Uh, in fact, it's not it's not in the movie, but in one of the interviews, he said that uh, Eddie uh, Eddie Giuliani and Roger Callard saved him a lot of uh, 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 construction gaps because Roger knew drywall. <laughs> and, 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 and 
electrical. So they were able to build everything to code. Oh, um, uh, anyway, uh, Ken lived there for a bit and then sold it. Um, I think it's I think it's on its third owner now. Um, but uh, when Ken told me that his oldest son, uh, who was a, a basketball player, played for the University of Oregon and is now a high school administrator down in Atlanta, Georgia, he said that was my uh, oldest son's bedroom was where Arnold and, and uh, uh, Ed Corney were squatting. He goes, that was son's bedrooms that's, that's kind of cool is it i thought um, they turned i thought the city of venice turned it into some kind of national monument that's not the, is that not true well it's 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 true in the sense that the sign cannot be if you if you go if you've seen photos of it it's a house but you'll see the gold gym um font the the yeah. signage is still out there yeah i've walked and past I, it a million times when i was out there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and someone and, lives uh, in there though is what you're saying i didn't know that oh yeah oh yeah and and the entrance you know, you could see the entrance on the front gated, but Ken said even back in those days, yeah. everyone entered from the rear off of Pacific. They would enter in the alleyway behind it. Oh, and okay. and uh, if you go in the alley behind it, you'll see, um, you could tell that people live there. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, anyway. That's funny. So they um, moved it. Yeah, they moved the gold from the original location to Santa Monica and because they wanted more room, I'm assuming, right? Right, right. Ken, yeah. Uh, Ken said it was probably about two and a half times the size of the original, and it, and it really wasn't even that big either. Yeah. Um, I think I think uh, the one on Second Street was about five thousand square feet. Yeah. Um, and uh, it used to be an automotive repair garage. Oh. Wow. But it had had it had great skylights. It had great you know brick walls and. A uh, trust ceiling and a yeah. good place to train. Right. Um, and so when you start researching this uh, and saying, you know, I think I want to make a, a documentary on the history of this gym because it's so, I mean, universally known, and there's so much history there. Uh, where do you start? I mean, I mean, how do you actually get started on a project like that? I, I don't know even know. I guess you know, Ed Connors obviously is a good historian, but uh, you had to go back beyond him even, really. Yeah, well, you know, that was the thing is, is uh, I was um, on the internet, and this had to be like early 2000s, and, um, and I'm reading, and you're reading these different things on different websites, and um, I'm sure we've all had the experience where you're like, that's not what happened. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's not true. Um, and one, because I joined when I was 17. I mean, I walked in there, and I was very, very lucky uh, in 1977, wow. um, I'm 60 now. Yeah. In 1977, and that was the year that Pumping Iron was released. Right. Um, I think bodybuilding probably just burst into the American mainstream in terms of awareness. It was still so new. Yeah. Um, and Ken had just organized this crazy Mr. America parade through the streets of Santa Monica. Um, to promote not only the gym, but the contest, because he he promoted that year's AAU Mr. America at the right. Santa Monica Civic. Okay. So it was, it was that's that's the environment I came into. It's like mm -hmm. you walk in, all the stars are there. Right. Um, t local TV stations are coming in constantly right. to, um, to shoot packages for the evening news and interview the guys. And it, it, it was just, it, it fired me up. Uh, as a kid, and then years later, looking back, saying, "Wait a minute, I was there. I know some of the guys. Right. I can contact them." And it kind of it kind of grew from there. What? Who were the main like the, I guess household names who were there at the time? You know, well, uh, when I when I walked in, one, um, and in the documentary, there's a point where I talk about. Of, of course, there's Arnold and there's Zane and there's right. Franco. By that time, those three guys were training at World Gym, but. Right. Um, Pretty much everyone else uh, was at goals. When I walked in, uh, Robbie was there, Bill Grant, uh, some high, uh, Mike Menser, mm -hmm. um, Pete Grimkowski, right. uh, high-level AAU competitors. Richard Baldwin was there training for a contest. Larry Gordon, mm -hmm. Tony Pearson, Manny Perry, right. um, a, a lot of people to me that, that that are names of people from the '70s and '80s. Remember, were the, were the Mensers there at that point? Yeah, Mike was, and then Ray came out later. I think Ray came out late '78, but uh, I think Ray came about the time that I remember, about the time Casey had come out. Yeah, uh, Casey, uh, Casey 
our tour and um but uh, and you know danny padilla would come out you know when he was when he was training for a show he'd right. come back out from rochester um so it was you know and joe eater would walk in and there'd be a couple of photographers like uh a guy named Craig Dietz, he had, and then he also had a Bill Reynolds, right. and they would, you know, do photo shoots right there. They'd set up the lights and do photo shoots. Right. Was um, so, was Lou there or was Lou at World at that point? Lou was at both. Okay. You know, Lou, Lou was at both, and um, um, you know the the whole, I mean, the whole Gold's Gym, World's Gym thing is a documentary unto <laughs> yeah, itself. Yeah, that's another documentary, right? Yeah, because we have both Joe Gold isn't alive anymore to do that one. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's. Um, you can get Eddie Giuliani though for that one, man. Well, you know, it was funny. I saw Eddie at the fire. I was down in Southern California a couple years ago, and uh, I hadn't seen Eddie in years since World Gym. And uh, went over and said hi, and we were talking. But uh, he doesn't. I don't think he really likes to be interviewed. You know, <laughs> I had him on my radio show years ago. Did he you? was great. Oh, he was awesome. Yeah. I don't yeah. think he liked, I don't think he does a lot of interviews, but he was really good on that show, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. He's got great stories. Yeah. He's great, great guy. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how I started the research. I'm like, you know what? I know, I know I, I'm still in contact. I'll get one guy to contact other guys. I sent out emails mm -hmm. um, and then got some back. Some I didn't, uh, but it was kind of, a, it's been a long, arduous process. I, it, I actually started this as a documentary on the 1977 Mr. America parade. Oh, so, yeah. you know, uh, the guys that were in the parade that were at Gold's were like Bill Grant, Ken Waller, Rudy Hermosillo, who was Sylvester Stallone's bodyguard and was a teenage Mr. America. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, what was yet. it? Uh, Rudy Hermosillo. Okay. He, um, if you see, if, if, if you Google him, uh, you'll see uh, him and Stallone, and Stallone's giving him the trophy at the 78 Golds Classic. Um, Rudy, but I got what's his last name? Uh, Hermo Seal, H E R. Okay. He was Stallone's M -O. bodyguard, okay. Let's, we'll yeah, and, uh, and he also worked for Larry Flint as well. Oh, wait, um, Flint. okay. Yeah, and, uh, and he was training people in gym, like the race car driver Danny Sullivan, a couple of actors from uh, Little House on the Prairie at the time. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that was the way that the gym was, but that's kind of how I did my research. It's like, wait a minute, I was there. Right. I may have been a kid, but I knew the guys. And um, so it kind of grew from, I think, interviewing five guys to eventually uh, 16. 16 people, about seven hours of interviews, called down to about 90 minutes. Who, was the, who would you say was, was, was the most informative of, of all the people you interviewed? Wow, I think it depends on what subject, but I would say I would say um, three guys: John Balick, yeah, um, good. Uh, Charles Gaines, who wrote "Stay Hungry" and "Pumping Iron," right, and and Ken Sprague, and one because with Ken you you learn the chain of ownership of Golds that a lot of people don't know. Mm -hmm. um, give us the give us that chain of ownership. Well, yeah, well, you know, everyone knows, you know, the, the name of the gym is Gold's Gym. So Joe Gold had um, had built Gold's Gym in 65 mm -hmm. and uh, sold it in 1970. And a lot of guys, at the time, you know, it's, it's hard for people today to realize. I mean, I know Gold's is, um, it's still a large brand. There's still, what, over 500 locations around the world. Um, but back then, um, there was no money in it. And uh, sure. Ken Sprague said, I think Joe got tired of just like running the gym and not making any money. So he was looking for a buyer. Mm -hmm. And then um, there were two guys in the gym, Bud Danitz and Dave Sachs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bud Danitz was an antique dealer. Dave Sachs was an engineer and was also a, a gym member. And they bought it from Joe. Oh, I didn't even, and, I didn't um, even know that. I, th I thought it went right to, uh, you know, um, what's his name? Ken. Ken, yeah, I know. I th that was one thing I found out. I How said, much Ken, did I they did sell it for? Did you find that out? You know, I know that Ken Ken bought it from Dave and Bud, um, and he said he had to come up with fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot. That's a lot. That yeah, back then it was. But what what um, he said what um, what Bud Danitz did when he bought the the gym from uh, Joe was he bought there was an empty lot next to the gym on one side, and then there was a house on the other side. Right. So Bud Danitz bought three lots. So when uh, Ken bought the gym from him, um, he bought those three lots. So it's like, okay, I bought the gym and I bought well, whatever reputation was at the gym. I mean, it's hard for people to believe by 1972 when Ken bought it, Golds hadn't promoted a contest. They still weren't 
really known outside of people that bought bodybuilding magazines. Right. So he owned those three plots of land, mm -hmm. um, fifty thousand dollars and assumed the mortgages. And um, Bud Danitz was desperate. He he had some antiques. Franco told me Bud had some antiques that were in the port of L.A. on a ship, and he had no money to get them off. Oh, and that yeah. was his business. So right. he's like, I have to sell the gym to get the antiques. Oh my god. Um, yeah, they were going to sell the gym anyway because they weren't making money either. Right. And uh, I think um, Ken said they came to me pretty much as a last resort. Like, hey, maybe this guy's got some cash. You Where know? did Ken get the money from? That's a lot of money back then. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Ken had a, 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 a production company okay. and he said we did everything from the oleo margarine commercials <laughs> to religious programs to pornographic films oh really goes, that's funny goes, oh yeah he goes it was on this he was it was on the sound stage and he said it was kind of funny because someone would be shooting a blue movie <laughs> on a saturday night and then you know we'd strike the set and then sunday we'd have a local preacher doing his <laughs> doing his spiel and he's like so right. and, and ken um uh ken also had done like a lot of the guys some modeling some hmm. Some modeling that was like nudity like stuff, you know, right for okay. certain magazines and whatnot. But he said he he got connected with a lot of people in Hollywood, a lot wow. of film directors and whatnot. So he said all of a sudden he goes, I kind of had some leverage. Like it's like if they liked me, they would invest. Right. So, right. yeah. So I think that's kind of how it came about. And he just marketed the gym. I think something that Dan, what? it's. Yeah, could what, what do you think Joe sold it to the original guys for? You, do you think? Uh, oh, you know, I think it was fifty thousand. Oh, so it was like they didn't make any money on. It. I got they, they yeah. got their money back. I got you. Yeah, and and and, and only because John Balick had mentioned that was the amount that Joe Gold had mentioned to John because gotcha. he wanted to sell it to John, and John's like, I can't come up with with the money at the right. time. Right. Um. But Joe Joe had incorporated it, so he had shares in it. Okay. For what that was worth, yeah, yeah, but it was it was pretty on the cheap. Balik, if Balik would have gotten a hold of that man, that would have been a you know a, a, a score for him, man. He probably like banging his head against the table that he didn't get the money for that thing, you know. Oh, I know, I know. I mean, you, I mean, I, I, Balik was a great interview because he mentioned his his um his ideas for the Iron Man gyms mm. uh, years later when when he owned the magazine, right? Um. But he, you know, he had ideas, but I don't know if that was in hindsight after what he saw what happened with Golds or not. But, right, right. but I, I enjoyed John's interview. He's just so knowledgeable and such a great guy. And, and he's a very good historian. He remembers everything. Yes. I don't, I don't think I would be able to come up with all that information. I've interviewed him before, too. He's really good. Yeah, he is. He's got like an eidetic mind. You know, yeah. he can tell you like a story about Dick Tyler in 1964, and then he'll <laughs> tell you about some story in 1989 or something. Yeah. It's just amazing. So all right, so you get, so we get so we got the the chain of command went from Joe to them to now they sent it to, to Sprague. Now, how did he decide to to finally sell the gym? Yeah, well, um, Ken, you know, he had it for seven years, and um, in those seven years, uh, Gaines and Butler had come out to chronicle and write the book Pumping Iron, um, shoot the movie a year or two later, and so it, it got really really famous under under Ken's ownership. Right. But his um, his wife at the time, Marion, um, had gotten really sick with cancer. Oh. And and this was in about 1978. And he said at that point he had a lot of irons in the fire. He had the gym. He had become – he basically had um, taken control of amateur bodybuilding with the AAU and gift-wrapped it to the weeders because they wanted the AAU under the IFBB banner. Right. Which – eventually I guess became the MPC. Sure. But he said he was doing that. He was running the gym. He had started running an other high end gym, uh, in North in uh, West Hollywood. And, um, and then he also owned a restaurant as uh -huh. well as real estate holdings. And then his wife gets cancer. So he says at that point, yeah. he was, I just had yeah too many plates spinning and, um, his wife who was dying. Marion had befriended, uh, Pete Grimkowski. She, she just says, you know, I think Pete would be a really good stewardship for the gym because he really cares. Yeah. So I think that's when Pete recruited uh, Tim and Ed. And it was a fourth guy for a while that dropped out early. But yeah. uh, that's kind of how the change of ownership went. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know. I thought Ed was the guy who kind of got everyone else. But it seems like it was it was Pete that actually recruited Ed, huh? Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Well, what did they pay for that gym from 
at that time. You know, I think it was, it was, I think they paid, uh, it wasn't a whole lot. And I think one, again, because Ken was, he didn't need the money, but I think it was about, and Tim Kimber, if you've spoken to Tim or Pete, they verify, I want to say it was like 125,000 or 150,000, but, but Ken had maintained ownership of some of the licensing fees on merchandise. Oh, um, at, at first, I think he eventually relinquished that. Okay. But but that was the pro, that that was uh, the pro, it wasn't it wasn't a whole lot and Ken actually um, was approached by another buyer group that offered way more than that like Ken had said it was over ten times what, what oh, wow. Gronkowski but Ken's like one I don't need the money and they're like we're gonna sue you he goes sue me of what it's my property you can't <laughs> you know do what you will you know they I, they wanted it but. Uh, yeah. It went, it went to the right hands, for sure. Yeah, well, he knew that the body bills would protect it. So now, when did they decide to move Golds? Was that after the purchase? Um, yes. And, and again, this, I think um, I had a really, really great interview with Pete uh, Grimkowski that I think I have about two hours of Pete that I have <laughs> to call. I've called it down to like maybe four minutes. Oh, my God. But there is so much. And the, the movement of Golds from 2nd Street back to venice yeah probably has a little bit to do with the whole world gym gold's gym war because ken sprague was offered the building that gold's was in on second street yeah the guy that owned that building there was a a a deli next to it and then on the other side of gold's was pussycat theater yeah and um but the guy whole and the guy owned the entire uh uh building and ken's like um you know, I'm 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 out of the real estate game. I'm out of I'm I, I've got other things on my plate. Well, Robert Blake bought that building. Oh, Beretta, um, the actor, right? Oh my so God. Robert Blake um, bought the building, and uh, Pete says, "You know what?" He goes, "I know that that Robert was chumming up with Arnold, and he was showing up over at World Gym, even though he was training at Vince's in the Valley." Yeah, and he says about that time we started getting a lot of holes in our roof and a lot of leaks. No way. And all of a sudden he goes, he goes, he owns a building and all of a sudden our rent quadruple. Oh, and he said, yeah. So he says, we, we didn't want to cast dispersions, but it was very, very suspicious that (laughs) we, he goes, we started sustaining a lot of water damage that other buildings in the same or other businesses in the same building weren't. And we were. And so, um, they lucked out. I think Pete went over to that building on Hampton. Yeah. And, um, you know, at that time, and it's kind of reverted to that, but in a different way, it was kind of in a war zone. And, uh, but it was cheap. It was like gangs, they were ready. Right? A lot of gangs around there, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. A lot, a lot. Yeah. A lot of gang activity in that part of Venice. And, uh, and um, Pete somehow had uh, connections with Ruth Galanter, who was an LA County supervisor. And she also owned property in that section of L.A., in, in the Venice section of yeah. L.A. So he got a really, really good sweetheart deal. And so they were able to get out of 2nd Street um, over to Hampton, a dirt, dirt cheap. And, uh, That's a good story. I didn't know that. Now, it's interestingly, Robert Blake was the guy who was accused of killing his wife, too. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Years later. So, yeah, years later. And he somehow got off. So it doesn't, you know, that, that, it might not be that shocking of a story to, to, to buy into that, that there was some sabotage at that point. But exactly. uh, because Joe Gold did not like the, you know, if you trained at world at Gold's gym and didn't come to world gym where he opened his gym, he didn't talk to you. Right. I mean, from yeah. a, Lee Priest kind of insinuated that to me, you know? Yeah, it, it was, it was a long, it was a long standing. Um, it, it's all, I, I had to kind of, I had to kind of, um, um, can you still see me? Yeah. It, yep. Oh, okay. Cause it just said my internet was unstable. Oh, so okay. I apologize. But, um, there were guys that were Joel Gold loyalists and guys that were Gold Jim Ken Sprague loyalists. And I mm-hmm. kind of had to, when I'm interviewing these guys, you know, because I, I belong to both gyms. Yeah. Once Ken sold Golds, I joined World and I enjoyed World. But um, Ken Sprague had beat Joel Gold in two lawsuits. And so there was a lot, a lot of bad blood. Um, uh, Joe, what were the lawsuits over? The lawsuits were, um, you know, Joe... Joe wanted back in the gym business and he offered Ken the, he offered money to Ken in like 76 for the gym. Right. And it was a low ball offer. And Ken says, you know, no, um, 
No, I'm, I'm doing well, thank you. And, and yeah. Ken said, the only reason I didn't change the name was I was just too lazy because I could have changed it to Silver's Gym or Ken's Gym yeah. or yeah. Jim Gym. He goes, it didn't really matter. I just kept it. Um, right. But anyway, so Joe wanted to, to build a gym and part of the non-compete clause in the original sale was he, Joe could open up another gym. He can't use his name. Right. But you, you can't use your name and you can't open it up within a certain distance. Oh, okay. Well, Joe, um, Ken says, I see Joe break ground on Main Street in Santa Monica, less than a mile and a half from my gym, <laughs> which is way inside. And he's already breaking. He goes, I let them finish the building. Oh, he goes, I let them God. finish the building and then I sued him. <laughs> and so he goes, I, I had Joe Gold dead to rights. He yeah. goes, there was no way he could open up a gym. He goes, but I looked across the table and go, the guy loves gyms. That's, it's like, yeah. I just made, I, I told him, I said, look, we can coexist. Yeah. It's going to be a great gym. We'll put forth some other restrictions. You can't advertise. Right. For a year and you can't have photos taken in this gym in any magazine for two years. Joe, like, sure, they handshake, they're, the lawyers sign off. No sooner does that happen, all of a sudden, there show photos of World Gym showing up in Muscle Digest. Um, <laughs> that um, what I guess what they did was they set up a ladder and took pictures through the window. Um, you know, but Ken's yeah. like, well, here we go again. It's yeah. like right to my face. So there's so so much bad blood that started with that that a lot of people don't know i didn't know but ken said you know what after that it's like you know what if fine you know we're we're both doing fine um but so that was interesting yeah i didn't know know that story who told you that story well i've heard it (laughs) uh john balick ken uh rick trace i mean it was and it's one of those things too that i think because um you know we all make allotments for our friends right you know um you know, people we know and they might do something we'll go oh you know i probably wouldn't have done that but you're my friend and i'm with you and i think they kind of stuck like franco and rick they're like yeah joe that probably wasn't too cool but you're our guy yeah uh and but there were a lot of guys that went back and forth there were guys that lived in both worlds Platts, lou yeah. um quite a few guys could go back and forth to both gyms and um, joe was okay with lou going back and forth Boys. Yeah, yeah, you know he loved Lou. I, you know, um, yeah. Lou was just great publicity, and for some reason, I don't know, maybe because he was Hulk. Yeah, Arnold's Hulk. guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Well, Ar- but Arnold never went to Golds, right? No, Arnold. Yeah, after um, after that lawsuit in '76, and and that was the um, geez, we're getting into like lawyer talk here. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is too interesting or not. No, I think it's very interesting because I didn't know. Okay. It was, yeah. But but Arnold, um, right about the time Education of a Bodybuilder had come out. You know, in the book, I believe he had said that Gold's Gym no longer exists, and now it is World Gym. And oh, then, <laughs> yeah, if you look at the first edition, or he had said that, uh, well, he also said going from Gold's to World is like going from an outhouse to a penthouse. Oh, wow. And he, he also repeated that on the Johnny Carson show and the Merv Griffin show. Oh, my God. And um, and then Bobby Schreiber, who is Maria Schreiber's brother, yeah. who Arnold, you know, he married Maria yeah. and Bobby was writing for the LA Herald Examiner, which was a Hearst newspaper in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, and uh, all of a sudden there were all, the, all these articles in LA Herald Examiner, shady dealings at Gold's Gym. Is Gold Gym a front for, pro- does Gold's Gym, you know? And so Ken says, I called up my lawyer, said, this is it. Just, we're going to town, yeah. you know? And uh, they slap. He goes. We slapped the lawsuit on Arnold for slander and libel. Oh wow! Really? I didn't and know that. um, and he goes. And we also sued Gulf, Gulf Western Paramount, which owned Paramount Studios, which yeah. was investing in Arnold's career at that time. Sure. And um, Arnold got to testify on behalf of Arnold, Artie Zeller, and Joe Weider. Joe Weider testified on behalf of Ken and Artie. Uh, was kind of like a hostile witness. He didn't want to testify against anyone. Hardy yeah. was just, I don't want to get involved. Right. Um, but um, anyway, so I jo- think a so lot Joe of- Weider actually testified theoretically against Arnold in a sense, right? Right, right. Wow. And that, and and it was it was it was a lot going on because Arnold's contract with Joe was uh, expiring. Of course, yeah. he'd already retired. Right. It was like 1977. Yeah. He was never coming back. No. Yeah. And uh, but he was chumming up with Muscle Digest. It was a smaller publication yeah. published out in Southern California. But Arnold was trying to use them for leverage, and Joe felt kind of hurt. 
But then, you know, uh, I think it, I, it's funny because I have the deposition papers. Uh, Ken gave them to me. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, funny. But it's pretty interesting. But anyways, the the, um, the lawsuit had backed off. And I don't know if Gulf Western had said, you know what, we're not going to win this. Let's kind of fold our tents. And it kind of just went away. But that's that's a lot of the World Gym, Gold's Gym, bad blood. Did they have to pay anything to it, Ken? You know, from, from what I think the lawsuit was still going on. Pete Grimkowski said he dropped the lawsuit because oh. he didn't have the stomach for it. Gotcha. And by that time, I think Ken's wife had died. But oh. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the deposition, I don't think that Gulf Western would have won that. I think Ken would have because, right. um, just because of what was in print and what was said, uh, you know, so. So when Ed and, uh, Pete and Tim took over Gold's, um, obviously they moved it to the new location, which was way bigger. Um, yeah. what was the, what changed? Because it looked like that's when Gold's kind of like took off into orbit, so to speak. Yeah. You know, um. I was a member there for a little bit, and um, I think one the space was larger. Uh, they eventually opened up few a few more bays in that building on Hampton. Right. Um, you could probably get like Tim or Ed to talk about it because they one that was their gym. They owned it. And they knew what they did. But it it one I think the magazines. <sighs> you know, it was like bodybuilding became huge. Right. Everyone was doing it. Um, yeah. And I think the magazines, when, when people would look at the magazines and see these guys training there, um, that everyone wanted to go there. And, and uh, it exploded. I think, um, you know, Ed had mentioned this, that uh, the logo of Gold's um, was over the window so that when the photos were taken inside the gym, you would always see the Gold's logo. Yeah. And so it just kind of reinforcing it and branding it. And um, at that time, too, let's, it was just before the Internet. Um, and people had to go to one location. They hadn't started licensing those gyms yet. Right. Um, and it was still a destination. So I, I, I think that's what, what did it, mm. you know, for, it, you I know, think I, the size of the gym helped tremendously. Oh as yeah. Well. Oh yeah. Uh, and Joe Gold was very, you know, he didn't play music. He, you know, he was very restricted in what you could do and you couldn't do there. So I think a lot of people didn't feel comfortable maybe in that gym, you know, oh, unless, you, you know, you're right. So obviously, goals became the the place that they wanted people in there. Ed Ed totally got the whole marketing aspect of it. I mean, if you were a bodybuilder, you trained there for free. They gave you free clothing. They wanted you to wear the clothes. They it was a very welcome environment. At least I remember in the early '90s when I went there. You know, so I think that was really what what made the gym so welcoming to the masses. You know. Oh yeah, you know, um, yeah. You mentioned that when you said. Um, um, the clothing and the branding. And, and two, I, I, I noticed a, not only a personality shift, but an age difference between world and golds, because a lot of the world guys were probably the original Joe gold guys from back in the middle sixties. Right. Cause I remember seeing a lot of guys that to me were old back then. Yeah. They're probably the age I am now. Mm -hmm. um, and they stuck with Joe through those years, but you're right. It's like, um, you know, Pete Grimkowski had said, we gave away a lot of, he called it activity. Yeah. And by activity, you know, um, free gym memberships, the clothing, he says, and they became walking, um, nope. you know, walking advertisements for, for our business. Yeah. But also, Pete, you know, I told Pete, I said, you know, not a lot of people would do that. And I go, you, I think Pete comes from an abundance mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, he, you know, he's just like, everyone can be successful. And um, he's, uh, <laughs> yeah. are you okay? No, yeah, I'm good. I'm just oh, talking oh. to my, my producer. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. And and um, and that's what I told Pete. You know, you're just giving away gym memberships and 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 clothing, sweatsuits, um, paying paying guys ways to compete. Right. Uh, you know, feeding them, and um, and yeah, like you like you said, it was just a way, way, way more welcoming environment for for young guys. What was the most um, I guess monumental thing that you kind of you learned while doing this documentary? Like, what was something like you said, "Holy mackerel! I didn't even really realize this. This is this is." Like this, this is something like that people are going to see. Wow, when they when they watch this documentary. Yeah, um, God. Um, in terms of the documentary, the content, I, I think it would be the history of the ownership of Golds, yeah. because like you, uh, you know, when I joined Golds, Ken owned it. I didn't even know about Gannets and Sacks in between, mm -hmm. and uh, unless you do a deep dive on that, right? You you wouldn't you know you you, you wouldn't know and I, I think that's it. I also think the backstory of, of the book pumping iron and how long 
it took Charles Gaines to get that thing published. He got turned down by, I think, three different publishing companies right. um, before he finally got that uh, in print. And um, those are two things that are huge that we don't realize that those things don't happen. If Gold's Gym doesn't stay open, then the book Pumping Iron never gets written. If that book never gets published, a movie never gets made. We never, you know, sure. so many things hinged on those. So I think I think those are the two the two biggest. Mm. Do you think that, so you're saying basically the Pumping Iron put Gold's Gym on the map is really what it amounted to? Yeah, I think so. I mean, one, because of Arnold, right? I think one, I think, um, like, Charles Gaines just said, we just, he was the first time I met Arnold. Um, I turned to George Butler and go, this, this guy's going to be a star. He goes, and this was like 1972 when they met at some little tiny contest in the East coast. He goes, there's just something about this guy, man. He's <laughs> just, he goes in, uh, he goes, we should do a book on him. So I think that's kind of how pumping iron I came see. about, I see. you know, I mean, well, I mean, Dream Big, it looks like a, a really good... I, you sent me about a, I think, a, what is it, about a six-minute or a 12-minute clip or something like that I watched. I, yeah. I, I was completely engrossed. I forgot I was a clip I was watching, and all of a sudden it stopped. I'm like, I wanted to see the rest of it. You know, I was so engaged in it. So I know you spent a lot of time. You labored a lot. I know you're, you're still trying to raise the rest of the money to kind of finish the project and get it into some of these film festivals. I think it's going to do really well. What's Thank your you. projection in terms of like when you think this thing might actually hit where people can actually you know watch it somewhere? Well, um, I have to get it submitted to the Venice Film Festival uh, in California by middle of September. Mm -hmm. And if it's accepted, uh, the festival is October 1st through 3rd. Right. So, right. so my hope there is that it gets um, some recognition and, and hopefully gets picked up I think uh, for some sort of distribution. So it'd be after that. Um, the, the plan B, uh, let's just say it gets no recognition, then I will probably do it self, self upload to like right. iTunes, Vimeo, yeah, uh, Amazon. I think it'll do you well. What, what, uh, how, what's the length of the film? It is, it is about an hour and uh, 20 minutes. Oh, good. That's uh, perfect. From start to finish, not counting credits. So, and, and, and I had to cut a lot of stuff out. I mean, sure. it just, uh, you should yeah, release you like a like a like a blooper reel, not or you know, or director's cut. As, uh, yeah, as yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's some really there's some really good. I want to see it all. Make. I want to see all yeah. the footage. I want to watch all the raw footage too. That, that okay. think that'll be great. You can probably make another whole movie from the raw footage you have. I'm sure. Yeah, pr yeah, pr probably. Just from yeah, Pete Gronkowski's uh, interview, from what you're telling me, you know. Yeah. Pete, Pete, what what an amazing character. I mean, just. Uh, you know, he's, he, it's, it's funny. I just think he's almost like the epitome, you know, a guy that flew out from Florida, huh. you know, he was, he left Rochester was in Florida, flies out with less than 70 bucks in his pocket yeah. is sleeping under the pier eating Dale burgers, <laughs> you know? And he goes, I knew people were laughing at me. He goes, I knew they're making fun of me. He's like, you're the guy that sleeps under the pier, you know? And, <laughs> um, you know, two years later, he was in a position to buy golds. And then a couple years after that, he had licensed it to, few hundred locations yeah. so um you talk about a, a seat of the pants believe in yourself kind of guy yeah um pete's it you know hey he envisioned it and he made it happen it, 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 that's really what it amounts to i mean it's it's phenomenal now you are trying to raise some money to to finish this film off what's the gofundme account if people want to donate to this yeah i, I sent the link it is, is gofundme they can check it on facebook um if they do, um, I want to put it up on the screen. So where can my oh, okay, thanks. Hold it? What's the name of the GoFundMe account? What is it under? It's under uh, uh, Mark Martinez. Okay. Uh, go uh, dream, dream big documentary. Mark okay. Martinez. We'll pull that up, and, and um, some people can see that. And what you know? What are you looking to raise? Well, what I'm looking to raise. Uh, my initial ask was about thirty, thirty thousand. Right. Um, the E O the E and O insurance is the most important, and we almost have that covered. What is that? Without, what exactly is that, that for? Well, it's uh, errors and omissions insurance. And so when um, when you write a book or uh, do a movie, and you put it out there for public consumption, um, there are people that might take offense. Um, although this movie, there's there's all heroes in this movie. There's no villains. Yeah. So um, there's really little exposure, but you still. Uh, in terms of also stuff that I had to purchase, there's a B-roll footage from um, Producers Library and Oddball Films and Getty Images and all these other places that sell right. stock footage and photos. Um, I have to I have to pay for. Right. 
And so um, you also have to protect yourself uh, indemnity against uh, anyone who might be in a photo that takes offense to it or something. And it's just, it's, it's, you know what you have to do in the legal world, and and so that's um. Uh, that's the air uh, the errors and omissions insurance. Gotcha. There's color correction, professional color correction, and sound mixing, mm. and then uh, uh, film festival fees. So, um, and you funded could, this whole thing yourself, pretty much from your pocketbook. Yeah, pretty much. I had a life coach named Mike Murphy. He's living in Columbia now. He runs a a cancer foundation uh, for women who don't have funds. And he's putting a lot of his money towards that. So he he helped get me started, nice. but it's been pretty much mostly me since then. And um, um, I could enter it into the film festival with the best color correction I can do and the best sound mixing I can do um, and hope for the best. Um, would prefer someone who professionally does that to be able to... Yeah, sure. Uh, kind of give it yeah, the once to, over. To really, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well... Cause, Good luck with the rest of the project. I, I, I implore Thanks. everyone out there who's watching, if you want to see this movie, go donate a few bucks to Mark's uh, fund. We put it up on the screen mm -hmm. because, you know what, the history, all we got is the history of body. But a lot of people know nothing about the history of our sport, about the gyms and Gold's Gym and Venice. This is, this is great. I can't wait to watch the whole thing, to be honest with you. Um, it, it was really captivating what I did watch. I know a lot of the people in it. I know Bill Grant very well. And Bill's a real character as well. So yeah. uh, you didn't get Leon Brown in the movie, did you? No, I uh, didn't. Uh, I didn't. Yeah. That would have been. Oh, I know. And yeah, an original uh, character from yeah. the book Pumping Iron, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good luck. You'll keep us updated when the movie's come, is ready to come out so we can tell our audience. And like I said, um, great job with this. And I really enjoyed the interview today. I learned a lot. Well, th thank you. I did as well, Dave. Th thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, having this forum. Absolutely. So, so thanks again. And guys, uh, that's going to take us to the end of another episode of the History of Bodybuilding. I'm Dave Palumbo with Mark Martinez. We'll see you next time.